title of this sermon is Making Godly Decisions. Last week we had the sermon on putting on the new self and taking off the old self. Well, to do that is a process through our whole life. And to be able to make godly decisions is part of that process. If you'll stand in honor of the reading of God's word, something Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 7 verse 12. He said, wisdom is protection just as money is protection. But the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the lives of its possessors. Again, we come to you, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us understanding, God, and help us to have a desire. We know you love us even when we're bad. Help us to have a desire, God, to want to be pleasing to you, to care about your heart. You gave your life for us, and we want to fall in love with you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Now Solomon had both of these packed with, he's probably the richest guy that ever lived and he for sure, the Bible tells us, was the wisest. So he had both. Problem is that he didn't know how to use the wisdom that God gave him always to make the godly choices in his life. He said in Proverbs 4 verse 7, the beginning of wisdom is to acquire it. And with all your acquiring, get understanding. I don't think Solomon always stood fast to understand what am I going to do with wisdom when I have it? Is it just to be able to help other people, judge my people, and help them know right from wrong? Or is it to help me personally be able to stay on track? And he didn't always do that. You know, we're going to be looking at two people today. Jephthah, he's a, he's a judge over Israel, great valiant warrior, and we're going to look at Jehoshaphat. And he is a king of Judah great godly man. The, the stories in the Bible that we see, they're people that actually live. I always thought it'd be neat to get in a time machine. You know, you've seen that before in Back to the Future where you can go out into the future or back to be able to go back and, and be part of these people's lives. They were real people and had real headaches and real heartaches just like we do. And God recorded them in the Bible for us to learn from and to be able to see, hey, if they went through this, what can I glean about doing things better and what can I learn from, from their circumstances? This wisdom thing, we'll just get this out of the way right off the bat. I love this little story. It's about these three people. One's a Russian, one's American, and one's a blonde. And I'm a blonde. My hair just fell out, but it was blonde before it did. And they're talking one day, and the Russian probably said, we were the first ones in space. The American said, well, we were the first ones on the moon. The blonde said, that's nothing. We're going to be the first ones on the sun someday. Russian and American, they laughed and said, what are you talking about? You can't go to the sun. It's too hot. You'll burn up. The blonde said, we're not that dumb. We're going to go at night. <laughs> and some of the things that we think through our life, and God must look down and say, what are you doing? What are you processing up here? Well, Jephthah, the Bible tells us in Judges 11, verse 1, he was Jephthah the Gilead. He was a valiant warrior, but he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead was the father of Jephthah. So Jephthah, and it's, he's one of the judges before Samson. We all know about Samson, muscled up dude, strong as he like my hero. But in Judges, it tells us about this other guy that came before him, Jephthah. And he is mentioned in the Heroes Hall of Fame in, in Hebrews as one of the heroes of the faith. So he was a godly man, but he had this stain on his life. And he was a muscled up man. He was a valiant warrior. He was one of the head people, strong dude, knew how to fight. But he was the son of a harlot. All through the Bible, we see Jesus coming to tax collectors, prostitutes, people that were cast out, no hope, wanted to help them. Want them to know that he'd be along their side, but we have to make the decisions in this life to be able to see what Satan's up to. Well, the Bible tells us in the next verse that Gilead's wife, Jebus' father, bore him sons. So he had some brothers, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jebus out and they said to him, you shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Now I would have liked the scene in verse 3 that his dad stood up and said, wait a minute, guys, sit down. I made the mistake, you're going to treat your brother right, but that didn't happen. Wasn't fair. You know, 
Don't, don't ever let your past define your future. Don't ever let your past, and all of us have a past, and we have mistakes that we've made. It's where we go today. It's the decisions we make from here on out. We can learn from our mistakes, but we don't need to be ate up with guilt. So they drive him out. Now the Bible says, it's the beginning of Jephthah's mistakes now when he goes out. It says in the next verse, Jephthah fled from his brothers. And he went and dwelt in the land of Tob. It's not very far off. And worthless men banded together with Jephthah and they went out raiding with him. He was surrounded by him, but he didn't have to be with him. But it was his downfall. It wasn't the mistake that his father made. It was what he decided to do with his life once he was casted out with the father from his father's house. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. What are we going to do with our future? Here he was, he had no family, no home. They threw him out of his home, and he didn't feel like he had any future. But he did. God was there. God wanted to help him. God wanted him to know, I'll give you a future. As we bring Christ's knowledge into the church, people need to know, when you're adopted into God's family, there's no one going to cast you out. God loves you. You're part of his family. You're going to heaven. And we as Christians need to treat people in the right way. We watch who we hang out with, though. Kids need to understand who you're hanging out with, the parties you're going to, the things that you're doing. All of us go through this. Well, the Bible tells us now that as they threw him out, he's the mighty warrior. He's the one who knew how to tackle the enemy. The enemy's coming. And his family and all of the Israelites hear the marching coming. It's the Ammonites are coming. And the Bible says it came about after a while. Now, after a while means that 18 years had passed since he's left. That the sons of Ammon fought against Israel. And the sons of Ammon fought against Israel. The elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. They said to him, hey, we want you to come and be our chief that we can fight against the sons of Ammon. They're in over their head. We're sorry about everything we ever said to you, and we threw you out. We need you. Well, Jephthah looks at him and says in the next verse, he said to the elders of Gilead, didn't you hate me? Didn't you drive me out from my father's house? So why have you come to me now when you're in trouble? Now, he knew why. Because they're going to all die. Because he's the only one tough enough to handle this army and be able to muster them up and get the troops going to where they can take him on. But he asked him the question, and the elders said to Gilead, uh, of Gilead said to Jephthah, for this reason we've now returned to you, that you could go with us and fight with the sons of Ammon and become head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So Jephthah, he looks him in the eye and said to the elders of Gilead, if you take me back to fight against the sons of Ammon and the Lord gives me up to him, will I become your head? It's a reasonable question. Or are you just going to throw me out and am I going to be an outcast again? Well, the answer, and I want you to see this. He says, if the Lord gives him up to me. He knew, even though he had made some mistakes and he had been with some outcasts and some, some bad people and a bad crowd, God is my God and I'm returning to him. And I cannot take these people on as valiant a warrior as I am. I'm going to need God's help. So the answer comes. The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord is witness between us. Surely we'll do as you have said. So you're not, we're not even going to let you fight. We're going to let you be the chief. You're going to, if you win this battle, you're coming back into our house, and you're going to be the head person. We're going to treat you good. Well, he goes to the enemy with diplomacy to try to offset having any bloodshed and there being a battle. He goes to them with a political endeavor to be able to talk to them and to be able to help them see, let's not do this. A lot of people are going to die. Well, they won't listen to him. They won't listen to him. The Bible says, verses later, the king of the Amorites wouldn't listen to Jephthah. And he said he sent him, and the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. 
So he's packed full of God now. And he knows I've done everything I can to be able to try to prevent this battleshed and this unnecessarily bloodshed. God's spirit comes on Jephthah. Now he's, he's back in tune with God. God always will bail us out. We see that with the Israelites and we see that in our life as we make godly decisions, we make mistakes. God will be there to rescue us. He's about to make the biggest mistake of his life now after God's spirit's on him. The Bible says Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and he said, if you will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it'll be whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it'll be the Lord's and I'll offer it up as a burnt offering. Now when he surrounded himself with these worthless people from the pagan countries, there was two gods that they served. One was Chemos, one was Molech. And what they did, they burned their children in the fire. Terrible, just ripped at God's heart. Terrible, terrible circumstances that they did. Now, people feel, and theologians are mixed over this, whether he really felt that an animal was going to come out, a sheep or an oxen. Usually you don't have them living in your house. But the question that he gives is, he's making this vow. If you give them into the, my hands, if I'll win this battle, and God's spirit already told him that you're going to, so there wasn't any ifs about it. It was a rash vow, it was spoken in haste. Well, the Bible says they go into battle, and in verse 32, Jephthah crossed over to the sons of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord gave him into the hand. So he won the battle. He's coming home. People are dancing in the streets, they're tickled. He's a hero. And he walks into his home, and the Bible says, When Jephthah came to his house as Mizpah, Behold, his daughter's coming out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She's so excited they won a battle. She didn't know about the vow. When she was his, and, and she was his one and only child. Besides her, he had no son or no daughter. And when he saw her, he told it, tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you brought me very low, and you are among those who troubled me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I can't take it back. What a tragedy. This is a vow that it was an unlawful vow. When you make a mistake, don't feel like you don't have any hope like Adam and Eve did. Run to God. God wanted this to end now. Oh, I love your daughter. I don't want you to sacrifice her. This vow never should have happened in the first place. Now, theologians are mixed on whether he kept her a virgin all of her life and she never had no children or whether he actually sacrificed her. The Bible doesn't tell us. But he never has any descendants from this time on. It's the last that we hear about Jephthah. I want to read something that Moses said in Deuteronomy 12, 31. That God had said, You shall not behave thus towards the Lord your God, for every abominable act which the Lord hates they've done for their gods, for they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. So Jephthah knew. This is something the pagan, these these people that I'm running around with. It rubbed off on him. He made a bad godly decision to ever make the vow. It should have never happened. Samuel said in 1 Samuel 15, 22, as the Lord is much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to heed than the fat of rams. So it never needed to go there. He never needed to make the vow. God told him, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be this. Don't have an if in there. You feel like you need to sacrifice something to me. Jesus talked about in Matthew 5, 33 through 37. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but you shall fulfill your vows. That's what Jephthah grew up hearing. You got to fulfill it. But I say to you, make no oath at all. Let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. Well, what is a yes, yes? I wanted to talk about that. You know, I kind of made a promise to God. I, when I was in junior high, I felt like God was calling me to be a preacher. You kind of know this story. I got off into drugs and alcohol and stuff. But I knew the truth. I knew how I was supposed to live. And I think many times one of the godliest decisions that we'll ever make is our choosing of a mate. 
And it is. To be able to choose who you're going to go through this life with and you're going to raise your family with. And we don't take that lightly. But for me, I didn't really want to be someone that slept around even though it happened and I got into that. But we make a vow many times, I'm going to stay a virgin until I meet the person I fall in love with and plan on marrying. Well, then we meet that person, we fall in love, and we're sure they're the person, so we feel like we can go there and do that. God's will is for us to stay a virgin until after we marry that person, till after we marry the person. What does it mean, yes, yes? It means you're my first love. I don't need to make these oaths. I don't need to make these promises. You're my God. Now, I'm thankful for God's grace and his mercy. And many times when a person loses their virginity, they feel like, well, I've blown it for life. I might as well just let it rip from here on out. Always find your way back to God immediately. He wants to pick you up. He wants to forgive you. He wants to hold you. And he wants to give you a future. You don't need to live in guilt. All of us make mistakes. There was a fellow by the name of Isaac. He saw the trouble that his mom and dad, Abraham and Sarah, had had in the family. And Isaac had a son named Jacob. And he told Jacob, he said, you're not going to take a mate. You're not going to grab a wife here from these people in Canaan. I'm going to send you back to your family in Paternum. You're going to take a wife from there. So Jacob packs up and goes, and he makes a vow, kind of similar to Jephthah's. We look at it in Genesis 28, 20 through 21. Jacob made a vow, said, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take, and he'll give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. Foolish vow. It's a more important decision than getting a wife you're going to be my God regardless of whether you give me food or whether you give me garments or whether you give me safety because you gave your life for me on a cross. That's why you're my God. And there's no ifs about it. And I don't need to make a vow about it. You're my first love. I want to live for you. Making spiritual deals with God only brings disappointment. I heard a statement that said, God doesn't want promises for a future. He wants obedience for today. And he forgives us when we drop the ball and he'll pick us up. But never make this decision that, well, if, if the doctor says I'm healed of cancer, or if I'm healed after I'm in this car wreck, God has given us healing through the cross, and we plant our eyes on Jesus Christ, and we want to love him. As these children said, you're going to love me. Jesus loves me when I'm bad or when I'm good. But we want to be pleasing to him. We want to love him. Now we're going to move into Jehoshaphat. He is a tremendous king. Asa was his father. Asa was a good king. And Jehoshaphat had pulled down all the pagan gods, had stripped the cults, had moved the people back to God's heart. And the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 20, 31 through 32, Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah. He was 35, so he wasn't a kid when he became a king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 25 years. He walked in the way of his father Asa, and he didn't depart from it, doing right in the sight of the Lord. So he's doing great until he makes an ungodly decision. He makes a bad decision. The Bible tells us as we move back into 2 Chronicles 18.1, Jehoshaphat, he had great riches and honor, had everything, a relationship with God, and he allied himself by marriage with Ahab. You know who Ahab is? He's the king of Israel. Jehoshaphat's king of Judah. Ada, Ahab's wife, is Jezebel. He's the worst king that had ever had come along. Hated God. Put Baal worship, Baal worship. He always said, you always pronounce that wrong. I always think it ought to be Baal. But it's Baal. Terrible fella. And he goes and allies himself by marriage with Ahab. Now, he didn't marry himself. It was his son, Jehoram who later become king, married Ahab and Jezebel's daughter, Atela. Led to terrible, terrible tragedy. It at first was an economical move, and it brought great wealth politically, but it's horrific in the end because Jehoshaphat 
dies later. Jehoram, his firstborn, was king for eight years, kills all six of his brothers with the sword, begins to walk in Ahab's ways, brings all of the Baal worship back into town. His son ends up becoming king for a year. Attila, now the wife that he marries, she becomes king and king kills all of David's descendants except for one, Joash. So it ends up terrible for the kingdom. That's just a little fast forward into what this brought about. But Israel's king, we see in 18.3-4, through 4, King Ahab asked Judah's King Jehoshaphat, before any of that happened, will you go with me to Ramoth Gilead? That was the enemy. He replied to him, I am as you are, my people are as your people. We'll be with you in the battle. But Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, please, let's ask what God thinks first. He done made the commitment. He done made the commitment. I am as you are, my people as your people. We're going to go with you. And now, by the way, let's ask God what he thinks. He done made the commitment. We want through godly decisions to come to God before we decide what we're going to do. Always come to God first. Well, the Bible says, after Jehoshaphat said that, Ahab said, well, let's, let's stay back there for a minute. Ahab said, uh, all right, I got 400 prophets here. We'll just line them up and ask them. So he asked them all. Could we put that back to the verse before there? He said, all right, we'll, we'll roll them out here. I got 400, 400 of our prophets. He asked them all. They all say, yep, go on ahead. Well, them were Baal's prophets. Joseph looks him in the eye and says, isn't there one of God's prophets here? Well, yeah, there's this one dude named Micah, but he hates me. He always tells me what's wrong. Well, bring him out. Roll him out. He brings him out. He kind of mocks him at first, sarcastically. He says, yeah, why don't you go on up, Ab?" Ab said, you're not telling me the truth now. He said, okay, I'll tell you what God told me then. If you go up, you're going to lose the battle. And you're going to die, Ab. Josephat's sitting there listening to it. He's sitting there listening to it. And instead of listening to God, after asking what the God's will is, we're going. They go out, and he gets so naive, the enemy's coming, and the enemy plots, the only person we want to kill is Ab. He's the leader of of. Israel, we're going to kill him. Ahab looks at Joseph and says, hey, put on your royal gear. We're going out in the battle, and I'm going to disguise myself. So he does. Joseph puts it on. The enemy looks at him and says, there's Israel's king. There's Ahab. We're going to kill him. Joseph sees what's going on. He pleads to God, and God saves his life. And an archer comes back and fires an arrow and here is Ahab with all of his armor on, and that arrow at random, at long distance, went into a joint in the, arrow, in the armor. Chances of it happening are nil. But it was God who told Ahab, you best not go. They went. Never ask God's will after you've said do what you're going to do. Ask God in advance. But then when God tells you, even if you made the mistake of planking the plan without checking in with God, then do what God tells you after he's revealed that to you. The Bible says that uh, after they came back and Jehoshaphat was safe, Jehu, the son of Hananiah, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord and so bring wrath on yourself from the Lord? That's been a hard statement for me. I've looked at that all week. At first glance, it seemed contrary to what Jesus said about loving your neighbor, loving your enemy, doing good to those who hate you. Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? I want us to look at that. We should depend on God. Remember the question that he asked, if you'll be with me, Depend on God, not a foreign alliance for peace. 
don't join into someone else's activities. It forbids compromise, forbid, the Bible always forbids compromise with an enemy and involvement in their schemes. And most of all, what these little kids sang about, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And he loves us even when we're bad. It ought to hurt our heart when people mistreat God. When people hate God, it's what Jesus talked about in Matthew 7, verse 6. Don't give what's holy to dogs and don't throw your pearls before swine or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. What's he talking about? You know, there's a proverb, that, and I didn't put it in there. It says, he who is wise, truly wise, wins souls. That is the gospel. We're to take the gospel to the enemy and to love our enemy and to be kind to him and to be good to him. But how we handle God's words, we're discerning when we witness. If someone's going to trample God, then it's time to move on to the next person. You never give up on that person. But we have to be careful what we do with people. Jehoshaphat went and joined forces with the wicked. You know, as I watched President Trump go to this March for Right Life rally, it wasn't to belittle anyone. And when we as Christians do not compromise the truth of God's word of what abortion is, and we stand for truth and we take a stand, we also take a stand in the right way for the lady that's made that mistake and we put our arms around and we love them and help them know there's a future. The same way we do with the homosexual. We don't turn our, hose, our nose up and, and shun them, but we do let them know that it's wrong. The Bible says it's wrong. And how we do that and how we work and navigate our way through that, only God can help us do that. Now, the Bible says after Jehoshaphat made that terrible alliance with Ahab, he turned around and God delivered him. It says in 2 Chronicles 20, 35, after this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, allied himself with Isaiah, king of Israel. He acted wickedly in doing that. You know who Isaiah is? That's Ahab and Jezebel's son. The reason I put that up there in the Bible helps us see that we need to learn from our mistakes. We don't need to live in guilt of our past, but we ought to learn from our mistakes so we don't repeat them. He turned around and did the same thing again. That's how my life went over and over and over. I didn't like the way my head felt the next morning. I was sick and some of the things that I did and how I cheated on reading and it tore my heart out. But I turned around and did it again. I couldn't figure out how to stop that cycle and how to live right for God. I want to end this with a story that happened up at Monday when I did the sermon for Rita's sister. The family was in there and we were sitting there had the visitation. It was a little while till it was going to start for the message that I was going to bring at the service. And Rita's niece's husband, he's a cool dude. He's a big muscled up old farmer. Thor is his name. And he, it is. And he reminds me a lot of myself, except he's a lot muscled up or more than I ever was. <laughs> but he's a partier and he's a successful farmer. He's got thousands of acres thousands ahead of cattle. He has a business where he makes crane mats on top of that and delivers them all over this country for where they get out in these swamps so they can put these machines on them and stuff. He diversifies into crop farming farms, thousands of acres. But he's a partier. And I didn't believe that he knew Jesus Christ as his Savior. And, he, and God put him on my heart. He turned around with me. He was sitting in front of me, and I was aggravating some of the little kids and stuff because I don't get to see him that often. He turned around. He said, you know, he said, uh, one of the best one of these funerals I was ever at, he said, was a buddy of mine. He said, he was drunk when he died. He didn't tell me how he died, whether it was a car wreck or what. He said he was drunk when he died. And he said, <clears throat> when he went to the service there, the funeral service, it went on for hours and everybody was drinking and partying. And it was just great. And I thought, that's the kind of service I always wanted to go to. I just never had the, I didn't ever find one like that. But I could relate to it. 
And as I got up and gave the message, I began to talk about Jesus Christ and that we need him as our savior because none of us know when our time's coming. And if this roof were to fall in on this building that we were in, I said, and killed us all, God would know who knew him as savior and who didn't and who's going to heaven and not. And in that sermon, and I'm outside in front of the hearse and the pallbearers are there and Thor's one of them. He told me, he said, you know, when you talked about that roof falling in, he said, my first thought was, I'd find a chair to crawl under. And I thought, well, all of us would do that. It'd be like if the plane's coming down, you know, we're all going to be trying to, please God, help me get out of it. Well, they loaded the hearse up, went to the cemetery. I'm walking up there with him. And I just felt God putting him on my heart. And I said, I want you to know Jesus, Thor. I want you to know Jesus. Well, then it's time we're at the burial site and we're there. They gave a little message where the whole family's going to go back to a restaurant and we're walking back and God just put him right there next to me. And we're walking and he said, uh, you know, I may not going to be maybe live too much longer because he lives a pretty rough lifestyle. And I said, God wants you to know Jesus, Thor. He wants you to know Jesus. He said, I'm going to get around to that one of these days. And the car's like 10 foot away. And Charlie's driving and Amy's in there and Rita and Rita's mom and dad. They're ready to go to the restaurant. And I almost left it there that one of these days. And I put my arm around him and he turned around and we faced the tombstones that was there in the graveyard. And I said, why wouldn't you do it now? And he prayed to receive Christ in his heart there in the cemetery. And I almost dropped the ball with it. I almost just left it and didn't take it any further. And it was tremendous. We got back in the car. We're driving to the restaurant. I told Rita and, and Amy and everybody that's in the car and Charlie. I said, Thor, he asked Jesus in his heart. I said, I want to tell Jesse, our niece, his wife. Rita said, well, you don't want to embarrass him. Maybe, maybe you need to let that soak in and let his, him tell his wife. I said, yeah, that probably makes sense. They got three sons in the car with Thor and his wife, our niece. We get to the restaurant. It's like 10 minutes away. Them boys come busting out, and they said, and it's snowing, and the roads are getting slick. Them boys come busting out, and they said, we're sure glad Dad met Jesus the way he's driving on these slick roads. <laughs> he told them. He told them. We're going to end this with something Jesus said in Matthew 7, 24 through 25. He said, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, slammed against that house, and yet it didn't fall for it had been founded on the rock. There's three things. You hear the word, but you got to act on them. That's the wise man. You find it on Jesus Christ, the rock, our salvation. Now the next one is the foolish man. Everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the blue winds blew and slammed against the house and it was fell and great was the fall. You all them verses side by side was too much to put on there all together. They're almost identical except for doesn't act and act and foolish and wise. The storm is exactly the same. It doesn't say that we're not going to get cancer. It doesn't say that we're not going to have tragedy and heartache and things go wrong in this life. The question is, when we hear Jesus speak into our heart and his love flowing, and Satan there is in, in them moments fighting in tooth and nail or ready to act on him, what does it mean to act on him? Does it mean we start doing good things? We start working our way at, at stopping all the wrong things? To act on him means, I want to invite you in as my Savior. I want you to be my foundation of my life. That was the decision that I couldn't make for Thor do. I could just tell him about Jesus. All of us, when we share the gospel, we can tell someone about Jesus and we can help them understand he loves you. And Father, thank you for every child and every adult in this service today. But we're thankful most of all that you're here and I certainly did not act well in my life. 
still don't sometimes. But God, you're our savior. And our heart is, as a body, we want every person to go to heaven. Every person we meet, even our enemies, And God, the decisions we make are so important because nobody can see Jesus. They just see how we act and how we love. And how do we really feel about sinners, God? Can you teach us how to do that right? And can you teach us to have compassion? You can. And you love us and you died for us. And so help us to be thrilled, not look at our past, but our future. And if we feel like we don't have one, you came today to give us that future and hope, to help us understand you died for us. It's already happened. And we love you, Lord. And I thank you for being our Savior. In your name we pray. Amen.